UFC 269 Charles Oliveira versus Dustin Poirier. Welcome to the prelim card prediction video by yours truly here at Boxing MMA Picks. He goes by the name of Zahn, I go by the name of Harris, and as usual, here at Boxing MMA Picks, we are giving you our fight-by-fight -fight breakdown, fight-by-fight -fight analysis specifically from the betting perspective, here to let you know which fights are worth the value, which fights you want to avoid, which underdog has the best shot at winning, and some parlay action sticking around to the end of the video. Please make sure that you subscribe, hit the thumbs up on this video, and most importantly, we want to hear from you in the comments. Very busy card, 15 fights on this pay-per-view event. We have nine of those fights, or 10 of those fights, I should say, taking place on the prelims. So we are going to get right to it, and we're going to start with fight number one. Fight number one, we have Jillian Robertson taking on Priscilla Cachoeira. This is a grappler versus striker type of matchup. Jillian Robertson, of course, um, her last fight, unanimous decision loss to Miranda Maverick back in March. She's on a two-fight losing streak. We know that she's going to try to take the fight to the ground. We know that she will keep distance on the feet until she finds that moment to shoot for the takedown. Uh, if she does get you down and we see that she lands two and a half takedowns per fight, pretty good top control, good submissions. We know she's a BJJ black belt. Uh, again, she's definitely going to be the grappler in this situation and want to take the fight to the ground. Priscilla Cachuera, on the other hand, she beat Gina Mazzani back in May. She's on a two-fight win streak now at this point. She's a pressuring, brawling type of fighter. Um, she's definitely going to throw heavy hands. She's going to stay right in front of you. Um, if it means anything, she trains with Jessica Andrade. She has that sort of similar brawling style in some ways, minus the wrestling, of course. And in terms of her takedown defense, 63% takedown defense. And I'm going to mute this audio that's tripping out on ESPN right now. So bear with me. Let's go ahead and stop that. It sure can. Smart keyword strategy hacks. Read the new case. That's better. So Priscilla Cachueta again, um, you know, again, she, she's going to be that brawler. She's going to look to keep this fight on the feet. She's going to look to do damage on the feet. Um, and, you know, again, she's going to have the clear advantage on the feet, in my opinion. I don't think Jillian Robertson is that good on the feet. We know that Jillian Robertson is going to have a significant advantage on the ground. Um, but to me, this is a 50-50 fight. Uh, what's really odd about this fight is that Jillian Robertson is a minus 380, huge favorite on this one. And simply put, I'm going to so sort of go with Vegas rules on this one. 50-50 fight. Jillian Robertson's on a two-fight losing streak. I know she has a clear path to victory, and I know it wouldn't surprise me if she wins the fight. But I just I can't go with Jillian Robertson at nearly you know four to one uh, in terms of how much of a favorite she is so i'm going with the underdog on this one plus 300 priscilla cachueta she could hurt her on the feet i can't ignore how much of a shot she has here as an underdog in a fight that basically is 50 50 one style versus the other style and really about who sort of implements their style more than the other um, so i'm going to start this card by going with an underdog priscilla cachuera plus 300, she's going to be my pick. Okay, so we got a contrast in styles here. We got um, Priscilla Cachuera, as you mentioned, uh, has that stand-up, but she has that zombie feel where she just moves forward. Uh, she throws heavy shots, and I think in the striking, she can definitely hurt Robertson. Robertson has been finished by strikes before. Uh, Robertson needs to get this to the mat. And when you look at Priscilla's fight versus uh, in her last match, she faced Gina Mazzani, and she got a win. She got a win versus Shana Dobson. These are low-level fighters that she's winning against. And then she has three losses versus Moana Carolina, Molly McCann, obviously Valentina Shevchenko. Um, but in the Gina Mazzani fight, one thing I noticed was Mazzani was able to get some takedowns, two or three takedowns in that fight. Uh, Jillian Robertson, I, I think, can do the same thing. The difference is I think she can hold her on the ground here. I think she has really good jujitsu. And uh, I don't like the odds here because, again, if, if this fight stays standing, then Jillian's going to be the underdog at that point. Um, but I think she's going to be able to get this to the mat. I don't, I don't believe in Priscilla's takedown defense. 
And I think Jillian, Jillian is very aggressive on top that stylistically she could get this win here to save her job. Let's move on to fight number two. In that case, we have Randy Costa taking on Tony Kelly. We see Randy Costa as the minus 195 favorite. Tony Kelly as the plus 165 underdog. Randy Costa lost to Adrian Yanez back in July. He's a switch stance type of fighter. Um, pretty crafty striker. Uses a lot of fakes and feints. Um, pretty unorthodox in, in some ways. You know, he looks to throw off your timing. Opponents have had trouble reading him at times. He even had moments in that fight versus Adrian Yanez. Um, dynamic striker, pretty good head kick as well. And you got to respect his power um, of his six wins. All of them are via KO, TKO. Um, so if he wins, don't be surprised if a finish is coming his way. A bit of a wild striker, high risk, high reward type of striker. And he's definitely going to keep the fight on the feet. He's going up against Tony Kelly, another fighter who's also going to keep the fight on the feet. You see neither guy has landed a takedown in their relatively short UFC careers. Um, you know, he last fought October 2020. Uh, he beat Ali al Casey at that time. Pretty good movement, pretty light on the feet, good quick jab, um, decent calf kick that he'll use. I wouldn't necessarily say cardio concerns, but I would say he does slow down a bit. Um, but from a prediction standpoint, I'll keep it pretty short. You know, this is a fight that should stay on the feet. And simply put, I think Randy Costa is better there. And I think he's better because he's a little bit more dynamic. He's a little bit more dangerous. Um, Tony Kelly, I expect him to look good maybe early in the fight. Um, but I do expect Randy Costa to sort of keep it going as the fight prevails. Again, like I said, wouldn't be surprised if a finish comes his way, Randy Costa's way. Um, but even if not, I think he can win a decision here. Um, the better striker, the more dynamic striker, Randy Costa is going to be my pick. So, yeah, I think this is going to be a striking match like you. Um, I think he's going to stay on the feet. I think Randy Costa, you got to give him the uh, a big edge in the stand-up. He was uh, tuning up uh, Giannis um, before the cardio set in. So that's where I'm That's where I'm worried here. I think Kel Kelly can win um, in that type of scenario in the stand-up as the fight goes on because Randy Costa has shown me that his cardio is not there. A lot of his wins, he's finishing them early. So... I'm going to go with Randy Costa to get this done. But as far as confidence goes, uh, the unknowns with the cardio here, he gassed in the Giannis fight and he hasn't really gone second, third round. And if this does go second, third round, I can see Tony Kelly just winning on activity at that point. Uh, so I think this is a tough fight. I'm going to go Randy Costa being the better fighter, but he needs to get him out early because then as we know, he hasn't been in the second, he hasn't been in the third round. So uh, there's that concern. So I'm going to go Randy Costa, but a little concern here. All right. Fight number three, we have Ryan Hall taking on Derek Minner. We see Ryan Hall here as the minus 220 favorite. Derek Minner as the plus 180 underdog. Uh, Ryan Hall, he lost to Ilya Taporia. That was back in July. A uh, number of heel hook victories to his name, of course. He has that really relaxed style on the feet. Um, you know, the hands stay down. He fights from distance, moves around the cage a lot. Um, you know, very unique style of stand-up, to say the least. A lot of kicks in his game on the stand-up. Um, that's his primary weapon of choice in terms of his striking. Shuffle kicks, side kicks, spin kicks. I mean, you name it. He's definitely going to use his feet as his primary weapon on the feet. Um, he will drop and roll to the ground. I mean, we see that almost, uh, almost to a, a boring style of the audience where he'll definitely go for it time and time again. He's going to aim for that heel. He's going to do it, um, you know, time and time again throughout the fight. Like I said, he wants to engage on the ground and, and he's willing to pull guard to do it. Um, you know, he's a fighter that's constantly chasing those submission attempts. Uh, he does have legitimate jujitsu. I will say that. Um, but again, you know, definitely a heel hook specialist and going to look for it at all times throughout the fight. With Derek Minner, he lost to Darren Elkins in July as well. Um, decent stand-up with a lot of movement on the feet, switch stance fighter, fights from the outside, kicks from different angles, um, fights at a pretty high pace, especially in that first round. Um, of course, that hurts him at times for those that survive round one. Um, also a bit one-dimensional from, from that perspective. Loves the guillotine, right? I mean, 11 of his 26 wins are by guillotine. Um, 22 of his 26 wins are by submission in general. Also has that wrestling, three takedowns of fight, 70% uh, accuracy at this point. 
um, you know, pretty, pretty hard fight to call. I mean, you have two guys that like one very specific form of submission. Um, you have two guys that just like submissions in general. Um, you know, typically in those moments, I wouldn't be surprised if this fight stays on the feet for most of it to that point. But I mean, again, analysis wise, I'll keep it pretty simple. Ryan Hall is just not a fighter that I can bet on. Um, not with that style. I know it tricks some people. I know it throws some people off. I know it frustrates some people. Um, but as he continues to move up in level, and not necessarily to say Derek Minner is a step up, because again, he lost to Ilya Tapuria, who in my opinion is, is better than Derek Minner. Um, but as he continues to stay active and fight in the UFC, I think guys are going to continue to try to figure him out. Um, when I look at Derek Minner, I see Derek Minner as the better striker between the two. I see Derek Minner having the better wrestling between the two. Um, and in terms of jujitsu, I mean, who knows, right? I mean, Ryan Hall has that heel hook. Derek Minner has that, that guillotine. But Derek Minner has submissions in general as well. So that might cancel each other out in terms of their grappling ability. So if I look at that on paper, better striking, Minner, better wrestling, Minner, better grappling, question mark. I mean, it, that tells me that I'm going with Derek Minner on this fight. Uh, he's a plus 180 underdog, but I think that's often because Ryan Hall is a little bit overvalued in terms of uh, his Vegas odds here. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if Ryan Hall wins again, catches the heel, does what he usually does. But if I'm just thinking about this fight in terms of how it goes more times than not, I anticipate Derek Minner winning this fight more times than not. Uh, so I'm going with the underdog plus 180. Derek Minner is my pick. Yeah, this is a this is a tough one here because um, obviously with Ryan Hall, we know that uh, he has that he rolls for that 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 heel hook and he's really good. At, he's the better jujitsu guy uh, by far, in my opinion, in this fight. Um, and I think it would serve Minner uh, better to stay out of the jujitsu. My concern is Minner is going to play jujitsu with Ryan Hall because I believe in every other aspect in MMA. I think Derek uh, Minner is the better fighter. I think he's the better wrestler, the better striker. Um, I think the other aspects, aside from the jujitsu, I think Derek Minner is the better fighter here. And he's the younger guy, uh, the stronger guy. Uh, I think this is his fight to win here. I think he needs to be careful to not play that jujitsu game with Ryan Hall. Um, this is a scary pick. It's a hard pick to make, but I'm going to go Derek Minner as well. Um, but again, he needs to stay out of that jujitsu realm. Just keep this striking. Because um, all it takes is with Ryan is, is one roll, and he has your heel, and he has your leg, and, and then he's ripping it off, and then you submit. So um, I have to go with Derek Minner. I, I, I can't ride with that Ryan Hall uh, early UFC style he, he rolls with, where he's only good in one area. So I got to go with the more well-rounded guy here. Hopefully, to just think about it. He, has, he's been, he's, he was scheduled to fight this guy, and in his training camp, he knows that he needs to stop that that role and, and and allowing him to get his heel his, his his leg so if he knows that's what he has to train this whole training camp he should be ready for that 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 single attack that ryan hall spams all fight so i'm gonna go derek mini here hopefully he's prepared for this because ryan hall is a tricky tricky fighter but if he can avoid the the leg locks he's definitely gonna win this fight fight number four Alex Perez taking on Matt Schnell. A pretty exciting flyweight fight here. Alex Perez, it's been over a year since his last fight. He lost to Davison Figueroa back in November 2020. A um, bit, bit more explosive between these two fighters on the feet. Um, very strong calf kicks. Stays pretty active with the jab and with the fakes. Good wrestler. He has that good single leg entry. Pretty active on top. We see he lands almost three takedowns per fight almost 50% accuracy as well. But with Matt Schnell, he lost to Rogerio Bonturin via unanimous decision back in May. Um, pretty methodical in the standup, technical striker, quick hands, accurate hands, good combinations, especially coming off of counter situations. He's a very efficient striker and has good movement in the ring. Uh, good striking defense as well. And again, that comes with that pretty good movement that he has. His takedown numbers won't impress you because he won't really take the fight to the ground. Um, but I have seen him take guys down. I, I have seen him showcase his grappling as well. 
But like I said, you know, he's a fighter that's much more likely to keep it on the feet as opposed to using any sort of wrestling. And I think that's going to be the difference in this fight. Um, before I even mention that, Matt Schnell didn't really look impressive in his last fight versus Rogerio Bonturin. He looked hesitant. He never really pushed the pace in that fight. He never really looked like he was trying to win the rounds. Uh, he almost looked like he was just sparring in some ways. Um, like I said, I like Perez here. I think he's more dangerous on the feet between these two. Uh, I think he's more willing to actually use the wrestling ability that he has, the ground ability that he has. Raz Schnell, again, is going to be looking more so for a technical striking fight. And I think that's going to work against Matt Schnell. Um, I like Alex Perez here, more complete fighter or more complete MMA fighter, um, you know, more dangerous on the feet, definitely will use his wrestling. Um, we've seen him attempt takedowns even against Davison Figueroa before losing uh, via submission in that fight. Um, so I, I think Alex Perez will be able to put at least two rounds together. And I think the difference will be the takedowns. Um, Alex Perez is going to be my pick in this one. Yeah, this, this is a good fight. This is a good fight they're serving up here. We got two guys. This fight, I think, is going to stay, stay standing. Uh, Matt Snell, I really like his stand-up here. I like his kicks. Uh, I think he has decent boxing, good movement. Um, but in this fight, Alex Perez here, he has dangerous leg kicks. Uh, this guy likely is the better wrestler, and he's definitely the better boxer. Uh, but the big thing for me in this fight is Matt Schnell seems a bit fragile. I think Alex is eventually going to crack him. So I'm going to go Alex to get this win here. I think he's the more durable guy here. And uh, I think eventually he's going to either win a decision or he's going he's gonna to crack Matt Schnell and finish the Fight number five, we have Miranda Maverick taking on Aaron Blanchfield. A pretty tough, close fight as well in the women's flyweight division. Aaron Blanchfield, she beat Sarah Alpar back in September. She's on a four-fight win streak at this point. Um, introduced in the ring as a BJJ practitioner. Always like paying attention to that. She's a brown belt, at least last time I checked. Um, I wouldn't say she's the best on the feet, but she does show that striking diversity. She uses the jab, the low kick fakes and feints, different angles. Um, she does have some striking IQ as well. Um, you know, strong body lock, strong clinch, solid takedowns. And of course, um, you know, she's pretty well versed on the ground, good ground and pound as well. Uh, we see that she lands like obviously very small sample size, but in that UFC fight that she had, three takedowns with 100% accuracy. So, um, you know, definitely has that aspect to her game. Miranda Maverick, she lost to Macy Barber via split decision in July. Arguable split decision. I thought she won the fight, if I'm recalling that correctly. Um, solid stand-up, you know, southpaw, decent boxing, good left straight. She is willing to engage in the stand-up, and I think that's probably the difference between these two fighters here. Um, she will throw combinations, and she will include the leg kicks in there. She has a good pace with good activity as well, and she likes to come forward. Um, you know, her strength is also on the ground. Um, you know, good ground game, good grappling, um, almost two takedowns a fight, almost 80% accuracy. Again, small sample size in her own right as well. And I believe she's a BJJ brown belt as well uh, in this fight. Again, the last time I checked, she has great pressure and control when she is on top, good ground and pound as well. And she's pretty strong uh, physically. When I look at this fight, I see two girls that are very similarly matched. I think Miranda Maverick's stand up might be slightly better. And it's hard to say who exactly has the better ground game, um, both with the wrestling and with the grappling. Although it is a 50-50 type of fight, again, because I don't really know who has the better overall ground game, I think they can, for the most part, cancel each other out. And although Aaron Blanchfield does have a little bit of striking IQ to her name, I think Miranda Maverick is probably the more well-versed striker, the better striker probably the more dangerous striker as well. And again, because of that, you also add in the X factor that I don't think Miranda Maverick lost to Macy Barber. So she's probably looking at this as a sort of a revenge to the UFC where she wants to make it clear and, and really wants to pull away for a victory here. I think she'll be the hungrier of the two. I think her striking is slightly better. I think her ground game can definitely keep up with Aaron Blanchfields. So Miranda Maverick is going to be my pick. Yeah, man, this, this, this is a tough one here because uh, they're giving us two prospects. Uh, they're pretty much saying uh, we're going to figure out who's, who's the better prospect here. 
uh, who's moving on. So this is a really hard fight. Um, both are well-rounded. Both can grapple. Both can strike. Uh, I'll make my my prediction quick here. Um, I think this fight can go either way. I believe in I believe Blanchfield is a legit legit prospect here. Uh, you look at her record here. She has a, a split decision loss versus Tracy Cortez. Um, she's a legit fighter in the UFC. She knocked out Victoria Leonardo, um, and she beat uh, she beat Kay Hansen. Majority uh, decision. Kay Hansen's another uh, young fighter uh, in the UFC. So. She has some good fights in the uh, Invicta. Miranda Maverick, as we know, has already fought in good fighters. We kind of know that she's she's at that level. I'm going to roll with Miranda, basically being the stronger fighter here. Uh, she's been there. She's fought the better fighters. And like you said, I, I believe she won the last fight as well. So uh, I, I like Miranda here to get this done. But I think this could be a, a trap fight. Aaron could show out. Um, but I think Miranda is going to be motivated here to, to, uh, to get the win here. Fight number six. In that case, let's go with Andre Muniz taking on Eric Anders. And I'll make this one uh, pretty quick in terms of analysis. Andre Muniz, he beat Jacare Souza back in May. Uh, he hasn't lost since 2016. He's on a seven fight win streak. We see his record there at 21 and four. Uh, he's a grappler. You know, of his 21 wins, 14 of them are via submission. Uh, Southpaw on the feet, pretty bouncy in the stand up, has a long jab. A uh, three-inch reach advantage we see in this fight. He'll throw those those long kicks as well. He'll use his length. He'll use his reach, um, and he's big. I mean, physically strong. Three-inch reach advantage in this fight, as I mentioned, even though they are both the same height at six one. Uh, for Eric Anders, he beat Darren Stewart via unanimous decision in June. He's a southpaw himself as well. Um, not the fastest hands. Not the fastest fighter in general. Um, has a little bit of one-shot power to him. Has a little bit of wrestling as well. Definitely willing to hold clinch against the cage for as long as needed. Uh, I've seen some cardio concerns with him, although it did look pretty decent in his last fight. Just in general, I do see him sort of slow down. Um, but, you know, simply put, although Anders might be the tougher fighter, um, and that'll be a theme throughout the remainder of this card, I do think Muniz is the more talented fighter. Um, I, I think... Muniz only has 40% takedown defense, so Eric Anders can definitely use that to his advantage and can resort to that, but I don't know how willing he's going to be to do that with how high of a grappler Andre Muniz is. Um, I can potentially see a situation where Anders gets him on the ground, Muniz uses his advanced grappling, puts Anders in a compromising position and potentially lands that submission. Wouldn't be surprised if that happens. If it does stay on the feet, I can see Muniz being the more dynamic of the two, not necessarily the better striker, but just the more dynamic striker of the two. Um, like I said, Eric Anders has that toughness to him, but I don't think he has many options in terms of how to win rounds. Um, just, just a little bit more basic from that perspective. So Muniz, more tools. Uh, Anders, not too dangerous in my opinion. Um, so I'm going to go with Andre Muniz on this one. I think he's going to continue his win streak. I think he's going to make it eight in a row, uh, minus 140 favorite in this fight. He's going to be my pick. Yeah, this is a good fight we got here. Um, Eric Anders, uh, he looked good in his last two fights, uh, the Derek, Darren Stewart win and the Darren Stewart no contest. He was winning that fight uh, until um, the illegal knee. Uh, so Eric Anders is definitely improving. He must be in a, a new gym here. I think he uh, switched his. He must have switched uh, his his his, uh, his training because uh, he, he's fighting. He's definitely fighting different here. His cardio is holding up in these fights. Uh, he's able to fight three rounds, um, but he's pretty basic. He has that robotic feel to him. He's very slow. He has a robotic uh, movement in the ring. Um, his, his striking really isn't getting that much better. And I don't think his wrestling is going to be anything here with uh, Muniz being uh, that much better on the ground. I think uh, Anders is going to be told to stay away from the ground. I think Muniz basically uh, being one of the better grapplers in the UFC is eventually going to get this to the mat here. And um, I know his cardio is a concern, but I think he could either finish him or even at least get two rounds, bang two rounds in this fight. So I'm going to go Andre Muniz here uh, being the better grappler by far. And I think uh, he's going to get this fight to the mat and utilize uh, that high-level jiu-jitsu. 
let's move on to fight number seven in that case. Another Brazilian in this one, Bruno Silva, taking on Jordan Wright in the middleweight division. Bruno Silva, pretty sizable favorite at minus 360. Jordan Wright, pretty sizable underdog at plus 280. Uh, Bruno Silva, he's on a six-fight win streak. He beat Andrew Sanchez in October. Striker, you know, lunges into his strikes pretty heavily. Looks to land big, powerful strikes. He can switch stance, um, you know, pretty dynamic in terms of his striking. Um, you know, he does swing somewhat wildly with the hands, um, but his feet are pretty crisp from, from what I've seen. Um, you know, pretty good kicks, good takedowns as well, good ground and pound as well. Uh, decent takedown defense, although I have seen him be taken down. Good scrambling ability as well if he is taken down. I've also seen a decent guard out of him. So, uh, you know, I mentioned some of the ground game, but I don't think it'll matter in this fight. Jordan Wright more than likely going to keep the fight on the feet. He beat Jamie Pickett in May. Uh, karate style on the feet, a kick-heavy approach. Um, decent tie clinch as well from what, from what we saw in that Jamie Pickett win. And, uh, you know, I feel like Jordan Wright might have a bit of a suspect chin, but I feel like Jordan Wright might be a little bit of an X factor in terms of how much power he has. Pretty big guy, uh, pretty underrated in terms of how big he is for this middleweight division. Um, but I'll keep it simple. You know, look no further than Bruno Silva's last win versus Andrew Sanchez. That was an opponent who had that karate-like stance, and Bruno Silva knocked him out, right? On top of Jordan Wright having a suspect chin, in my opinion, I think Silva more than likely gets a finish here. Um, I'm not going to bet the finish because results are very difficult to pick with accuracy, but I think I'm pretty comfortable in picking Bruno Silva to win this fight. And like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if he does get the finish. Bruno Silva is going to be my pick. Yeah, I like this fight. It's going to be a striking fight, I believe. Um, with Jordan Wright, though, you got to know that he's that he doesn't need one shot, and he can knock you out with that karate uh, accurate uh, striking he has. Um, but I think it's going to come down to another thing where uh, Jordan Wright just seems a bit fragile to me. Uh, I think that uh, Bruno's going to eventually crack him. Uh, we've seen in Bruno's last fight, he fought a guy that was out striking him, was out wrestling him, and he went to his heart and won the fight in the in, in the third round. So this is a guy that has more heart. This is the guy that is going to be the tougher guy that can take more shots, and and he has power as well. So I think he's going to be able to connect uh, eventually uh, with with his relentless uh, pressure here. Um, but I see him utilizing his jujitsu, getting some takedowns. And I see him getting an easy win utilizing that. I don't think he's going to want to stand and bang with Jordan Wright. I think he's going to take it to the mat. So I'm going to go Bruno Silva. Fight number eight, we have Augusto Sakai taking on Tai Tuivasa. A heavyweight fight here. So right away, we are going to say heavyweight beware. Anything can happen in heavyweight fights. But breaking this fight down, Augusto Sakai, he lost his Jar Jarzinho Rosenstrike back in June. A uh, two-fight losing streak. He's a striker. Thai boxing style of stand-up in some ways. Mostly hands, though. The occasional kick here and there, but definitely um, mostly hands. Uh, pretty accurate hands. Some pop in his punches as well. He does have good punch IQ. Decent movement. Uh, we actually see him fight off the back leg at times. Sometimes he circles the cage as well. Um, so, you know, surprisingly good movement out of him. But I don't think he's really a threat to land a takedown. Um, you know, definitely willing to use the clinch against the cage, but definitely going to keep the fight on the feet. A lot of the same things I can say about Tai Tuivasa, right? I mean, he beat Greg Hardy back in July. He's on a three-fight win streak. If you remember that fight, that was a fight where Greg Hardy um, had clipped him. Greg Hardy sort of came in a bit aggressively, and Tai Tuivasa landed that, uh, that counter um, overhand right, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, he's considered a street fighter, so that kind of tells you all you need to know. Australian, so definitely has that, that toughness to him. Uh, decent stand-up. You know, he'll probably control the center of the octagon. He's more willing to do that between these two fighters. Uh, good jab, good overhand right, like I mentioned, uh, especially as a counter. Like I said, that is what finished Greg Hardy. Um, great usage of calf kicks as well, and, and I think that's actually going to be the biggest difference in this fight. Uh, he stays pretty patient. He maintains a decent pace. He won't gas himself out. Uh, definitely has some clinch ability as well. Um, like, again, like many heavyweights do. But like I said, I like Tuivasa in this spot. Uh, I think he's more of a threat on the feet. 
I think he's more diverse with the stand-up as he includes those calf kicks. He throws them time and time again. If you remember that Greg Hardy fight, he had Greg Hardy's legs hurt, um, uh, again, before Greg Hardy kind of clipped him. But he used that calf kick very effectively. I can very much see him doing this in this fight as well. Um, and I trust Tai Tuivasa's knockout power more than I trust Augusto Sakai's knockout power. Again, in a heavyweight beware where anyone can catch anyone. Um, so I, I trust Tai Tuivasa's power more. I trust his diversity more. I trust his calf kicks more. It's still a heavyweight beware. This fight is a pick em for a reason. Um, but my pick is going to be Tai Tuivasa. Yeah, this is a this is a tough fight. These guys are pretty similar. Look at the the stats here: similar height, similar weight, uh, similar reach. Uh, Sakai, I think, is the more active striker. Uh, he, he's plotty. He'll hold you against the cage, uh, get some octagon control that way. Um, but when I look at um, Tuivasa, Tuivasa is going to be the guy with the better punches. He's going to be the guy throwing the better power. The more power in the fight, the more telling shots for the judges. Uh, this fight can go either way. I'm going to go with Tuivasa as well. I'll make it quick. I just think that um, when it comes what it comes down to in this fight, I think the power is going to be the big difference here. I think he's going to be the one throwing the harder shots uh, to win the rounds if it goes to a decision. Um, if someone gets knocked out, I think Sakai would be the one to get knocked out as well. So I think a lot of factors are going tied to Ivasa's way. Now, I know he's on a three-fight winning streak, but that's against low competition compared to Sakai. He fought Hardy, Hunsucker, and Strew, while Sakai uh, obviously lost his last two fights uh, to Rosenstruck and Overeem, but obviously that's a much higher level. Um, but I like Tai Tuivas. I think stylistically uh, the power – I think he's going to be the better striker uh, in this fight. And if he, if he wants to hold him against the cage, if Sakai wants to do that, I think Tuivasa has enough, uh, enough strength to turn him around or to break free from that and to get back into, into the striking realm. So I'm going to go Tuivasa being the better striker, the more power uh, to get this win. Let's move on to fight number nine, probably the most difficult fight on the prelim, if not the card or one of the more difficult fights, we have Pedro Munoz taking on Dominic Cruz. Uh, Pedro Munoz lost to Jose Aldo back in August. Um, you know, pretty complete fighter. Sets his game up with a pretty active calf kick, good stand-up, cuts the ring off well. Patient, you know, willing to start slow to kind of read his, take time and read his opponent. He does sit on his strikes a bit. Punches kind of come one at a time. Could be a little bit more active despite those numbers there that you see in terms of those significant strikes landed per minute. Uh, I do like his striking defense. He does show some patience in the ring as well. Um, I do like his in and out movement as well. And, uh, you know, although he will keep it on the feet, he has pretty good balance, um, you know, 80% takedown defense. And I think that's going to be very relevant in this fight going up against Dominic Cruz, who, of course, we know. Um, not to say a takedown specialist, but definitely takedowns are a strong part of his game. Uh, Dominic Cruz, he did get back into the win column. He beat Casey Kenny via split decision in March. Um, you know, has that movement. Uh, hard to say if it's great movement, but it definitely is great for the UFC in terms of how effective it's been throughout his career. Um, he can keep that movement up for the entire fight. The movement's awkward. It gives a lot of fighters problems. Um, we saw Casey Kenny just unable to find him, unable to read him almost the entire fight. He's a pretty active striker, pretty diverse striker as well. He throws some weird angles, weird unexpected combinations. And again, somehow, some way they work in the UFC. And it's been like that throughout his entire career. And, and again, we know the wrestling that he has. I mentioned that at the beginning of, of that analysis, three takedowns of fight, almost 50% accuracy. Um, that is something that he can resort to at least show it, even if you stuff it, um, you know, look for him to kind of go for it, quickly release it and land one of those sort of awkward combinations. If he feel that if he feels that you are going to defend it successfully, um, you know, Cruz's movement could be a problem in this fight. You know, will Munoz have problems catching Cruz the same way that Casey Kenny had? Um, I don't think Cruz will be able to use the wrestling in this fight. Because again, I think Munoz has pretty good takedown defense, but Cruz also has high wrestling IQ. So he might look for sort of those awkward situations where maybe it's not the clearest takedown, 
but maybe he ends up on top and it sort of looks like a takedown, whether it's legitimate or not. I think just like the Casey Kenny fight, this is going to be a close split decision type of fight. And I mean, call it a bit of a hunch, call it a bit of a gut pick, call it a bit of an X factor. But I think the judges and I think the UFC are going to be a little bit more likely to favor Dominic Cruz in a close fight. Um, so I'm looking at a close one here. I don't think Munoz will clearly take it. I don't think Cruz will clearly take it. And in that situation, I think the UFC would give it to Cruz. And again, that's just a hunch. Uh, it's a very difficult fight to call accurately, in my opinion. So I'm going with a bit of a gut pick. I did this in his last fight versus Casey Kenny. I'm doing it in this fight as well. I'm going with my gut. and I'm going with Dominic Cruz. Yeah, this is real 50-50. Uh, uh, this is a tough one here. Um, Pedro Munoz, uh, obviously, he's going to want to push those leg kicks, slow down Dominic Cruz. Uh, but I'll make this prediction real fast here. I think with the big octagon this weekend, it's going to favor Dominic Cruz. They're fighting in the big octagon, so you can be able to have that movement. And being um, having a couple inches in reach with that movement is only going to help Dom Cruz here to win a, a point decision here. So I'm going to go Dominic Cruz here just to, to move around frustrate uh munos um i think he can do something similar to what frankie edgar did um but in a more effective way so i'm gonna go dominate cruz here uh to move around use that ring use the cage and i uh, use that three inch reach here and uh when it when i uh, a point decision here so dominate cruz is my pick let's move on to our final fight of the prelims um crazy that this is a prelim because you have two fights in a row that could headline a fight night here. We have Josh Emmett taking on Dan Ige. Um, Josh Emmett, he's on a three-fight win streak. Um, his last fight, however, was a year and a half ago. He beat Shane Burgos via unanimous decision back in June 2020. Uh, 36 years old at this point, but at least based on his last performance, I can't really say he's anywhere close to being done. Um, decent lateral movement, has you know good power, comes in heavy and forceful with the hooks, three, four, five hooks in a row as he marches forward. Um, definitely has underrated punching speed, I will say that. Um, you know, real tough, always willing to engage. He does take one to give one. College wrestler as well, um, still has that in him, almost one and a half takedowns per fight at almost 50% accuracy. Uh, just an overall high level fighter in, in Josh Emmett. And let's see how he's going to look sort of 18 months later in terms of the last time he fought. Dan Ige, he lost a Korean zombie back in June. Um, good all-around good all around fighter in his own right. Good stand-up. He'll show those fakes and feints. He'll show the level changes. Good punch IQ. Good combinations. Good in-and-out movement and good lateral movement. Um, good accuracy in his strikes. If he is going to be taken down, I've seen a pretty good defensive guard from him. Um, good clinch, and he also has the ability to take you down as well. Um, almost 1.5 takedowns in his own right, albeit 25% accuracy. Um, when I when I think about how this fight is going to go, um, you know, I think about Josh Emmett's toughness. You know, he had a really, if you watch that fight versus uh, Shane Burgos, compromised me in the first minute of that fight, uh, and, and still managed to pull a unanimous decision win. Um, I believe this fight will stay on the feet. I think Ige will be the fighter fighting from the outside. I think either guy can catch the other and, and change the course of the fight, you know, sort of wobble them and sort of put the pressure on from there. But again, I go back to that toughness element. I think Josh Emmett's toughness is what's going to decide the fight. I think he's a little bit more aggressive. I think he has a bit better control. And I think he's a little bit more intentional with his striking in comparison to Dan Ige. Um, so this is a very tough pick. This is not to say put it on your parlays or anything like that. Um, but in terms of a one-off fight, I really want to see what this looks like at weigh-in. I really want to see what the ring walks look like. Um, but as of right now, I'm leaning on the side of Josh Emmett. Yeah, that's that's fair, man. This is a for me. This is a really hard fight. I think this can go either way here. I think uh, Ige is a live, live, super live underdog here at these odds. Um, but for me, this fight's going to stay on the feet. I think this fight's going to stay on the feet. It's going to be a striking fight. 
I think technically Ige might be the better technically uh, be- technical better striker. However, I think that Emmett with that power makes up for the the small difference that they may have. Again, Emmett may be the the better striker as a whole. Um, but again, I, I think Emmett's going to eventually connect here. But I think this is a close fight that can go either way. That you can't feel confident on either side. But I'm going to bank on Josh Emmett because when I saw Dan Ige versus uh, the Korean Zombie. I was really let down how how easy he let the Korean Zombie beat him. Um, the way he was able to hold him on the mat, um, I was surprised. And I think Josh Emmett can can connect here. So I'm going to go Josh Emmett here to get this done. Uh, knockout decision, Josh Emmett's my pick. All right, let's take it to Vegas at that point. We got 10 fights to choose from on this undercard. Quite a bit of options. Uh, let's first start with the underdog that you feel has the best shot at winning. All right. Underdog wise. Is Tutui Vasa an underdog? I'm going to go pick. Dominic Cruz. Dom Cruz. Okay. So you have a couple of pickums. Tutui Vasa is a pickum. Cruz is also a pickum. Um, so we'll count either of those fights as underdogs. Um, so I will select Dominic Cruz for you from that perspective. Uh, in terms of myself, the underdog that I feel has the best shot at winning, I'll echo Dominic Cruz because I do legitimately feel like he'll win that fight. If I were to maybe add another underdog that has the best shot at winning, I'm going to go ahead and make mention of... I say Derek Minner. I think Derek Minner has a really good shot at winning. Again, as you mentioned, all training camp, he should just be looking to avoid that heel hook. And if he does that, the fight's in his favor, in my opinion. Um, so I'm going to provide two underdogs there. Now, in terms of favorite pick or favorite couple of picks, who are you taking a look at? Uh, I'm looking at uh, Bruno Silva. I'm looking at... Uh, hold on, hold on. Alex Perez. And I'm looking at uh, Randy Costa. All right, so those three would be a plus 156. $100 will return 256 for our bigger betters. $250 will return 640 My picks will look very similar. Um, The first two that you mentioned were the first two that I was looking at. I'm going to exclude and Randy Costa out of that. So I'm looking at keeping it simple, not the biggest payout, but Bruno Silva and Alex Perez. Those two would pay a minus 150. $100 will return 167. For our bigger betters, $250 will return 417. So let's sign off. On that note, you know what to do at this point. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the thumbs up. Make sure you comment as well. We want to hear from you. How do you feel about our picks? Who are your picks going into this weekend? And uh, of course, if there's any specific parlay action that you want to have a discussion about, we're more than happy to provide some additional commentary there. But like I said, officially signing off, this has been the UFC 269 Charles Oliveira versus Dustin Poirier prelim card prediction video by yours truly here at Boxing MMA Picks. He goes by the name of Zahn. I go by the name of Harris. And as usual, let's get this money. Let's do it.